You're watching a webinar called Preparing for Reliability with Emerging Asset Performance Technology Trends. This webinar is sponsored by B Smart Logistics, IGT, and Asset Acumen Consulting. It features a program hosted by Gordon Foote of IGT and Don Berry from Asset Acumen Consulting. Thank you for watching. Here's the presentation. So morning everyone and welcome to the second in our series of Caribbean webinars, uh, both of which have been on asset management, asset performance is what we're doing this morning. And it's about your business. It's about your business. So let me just quickly tell you about the team that we have here. I'm, I am with Info Global Tech, a services organization, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we do shortly. But we are partnering with Don for this morning's webinar to bring to you information about asset performance technology and what's happening in the, in the space. I'm a consultant with IGT, right? Uh, you, we, I am with Info Global Tech. That's what IGT stands for. And I have phone. I used to. I used to be with IBM thirty plus years, and I left IBM and joined this organization as a consultant. Uh, I found in them very experienced employees in many areas and aspects of business. They are out of. They are headquartered in the US, out of Canada and out of India, where much of their resourcing takes place. They offer significant services in many areas and i have found having come from ibm that their clients are very satisfied with them in what they do and this is the core of who info global tech is go ahead so at the high level there are six areas which are all listed on the screen uh, data engineering QA engineering and transformation, legacy and app modernization, process and automation engineering, integration services, and much of what is happening today in terms of mobility and cloud services. And so we see our participation here in the space around asset management, where we have skills of implementation, support, connectivity across systems to bring value to clients. Innovation. We have an innovation lab that we bring to the table in most of our engagements that demand it, of course. But we believe we should always deliver our clients' projects on time. Not before time, not after time, because it's part of our overall plan. And so we focus on quality, we focus on cost, and we focus on delivery. We bring strong integrated teams, mostly badged as IGT employees, um, the majority of the time. But there are times where we partner, like with Don, because of his skills, capabilities, and experience, which we want to bring to the table in every engagement to solve challenges, whether they're complex, whether we can simplify them. But we bring together a global team to be able to address your solution. And so that's what we're focused on this morning around asset management. Every business is in business for profit. They may not be making the level of profit. They may have other challenges, but we want to make sure <clears throat> that whenever we come together and bring solutioning together for our clients, as we're doing this morning, <clears throat> we are focused on delivering value to the client in the areas that they expect. And so this morning, uh, and so this morning, I would like to introduce you again, to, for some of you, to Don Barry from Asset Acumen Consulting. I'll ask him to introduce himself, and Don could take an hour. There, listen, there are some people who follow the industry, and there are some people who make the industry and help to direct the industry. Don is the latter, and he'll tell you about himself, his experience, so he brings people on board to understand the potential value of this area in asset management, asset performance. Don, let me hand over to you. It's really about you and our topic this morning for value for the clients. Okay, thanks, Gordon. 
So we're going to talk today about preparing for reliability with emerging asset performance technology trends. And so that's the intent. This presentation was really a combination of frustrations, if you like, that I've observed in the industry. Folks started reliability or think they have a definition of reliability, really aren't doing what they ought to be doing. They're kind of hugging what they're doing today and not necessarily preparing themselves for where things are going to be going in the future. And so with that in mind, I, I thought I would put this presentation together to talk about reliability and specifically technology trends around the, the notion of asset performance. So that's what we're gonna uh, talk about today. So a little bit about my background, I'm not gonna get into a whole lot. Basically, there's a lot here you can read at your leisure. I have more like 45 years, I was 42 years at IBM. I've been around four years since then, uh, poking at asset management, love this space. I was a thought leader. I was the global leader at IBM for their uh, uh, center of competency for both Maximo and for asset management strategy. I am an RCM2 practitioner. Uh, I'm also a very, very deep parts person. I, I manage the parts operation for Canada for about uh, 10 years or so. So I do have a fairly diverse background, but pretty much all in asset management and love to be able to share that. I've also been teaching at the University of Toronto since 2004. We've been putting on a physical asset management program uh, that goes on for originally eight days, now five days. We have a version of that that I participate in that can be either one, two, or four days. I'll talk about some of those trainings later on um, at the end of this presentation. I also have an opportunity to present if, if you need that asset management leading practices. That's a one-day program. I have a specific one that's two days for municipalities. I teach RCM mostly face-to-face -face now. We, we don't really teach that remotely, so we need COVID to kind of whittle its way through so we can do that more direct in a classroom. I have a maintenance parts excellence program that I teach IT and IOT because there's simply a lot of technology that people aren't catching up on. And so very much we cram in an awful lot of material in one day in that presentation, people looking to include data, asset hierarchy type things that can help with that, KPI workshops. That's very much a, a fit for purpose by company that we, we support those kinds of things. So what am I gonna talk about today? Mostly I'm going to talk about traditional value of asset management and how that might fit for technology. So I'm going to emphasize the notion of the trends in technology and in industry 4.0. I'm going to emphasize the gaps between today and tomorrow in terms of mo where most organizations are. I'm going to talk a fair bit about asset performance and management. That's a, an evolving tool, but I'm also going to talk about how a lot of people declare they're in that space. And when you look at who really declares what they're doing in that space, it's still very much the wild, wild west in terms of what it is you could be doing and, and which pieces that you might pick up. I'm going to talk about I, the IT continuum in asset management, how we need IT to really help us drive the art of the possible in asset management. I'm going to talk about reliability in the culture and, and where people typically are and where they need to be and how they likely need to reset their mindsets in terms of uh, where they need to be if they want to get a good handle on technology. We're going to talk about driving value decisions from insights, information, and data. We're going to talk about leveraging data where value happens. Uh, we're going to provide some examples of APM insights. We're going to talk about an example of, of uh, APM insights, specifically around Maximo, but also touch a little bit on SAP since I did present at an SAP conference in Australia a couple of months back. And then what's next? And we'll just close out there, open up for some questions, talk a little bit about how you might solve some of these things and share, as I said, I would, uh, some of the training that's coming up. So we'll open up for questions at the end. So the traditional value of asset management is really about notionally having your assets all set up to understand where the value is. And I love picking up a water bottle, so I'll do it here as well. Here's your water, bo water bottle. What exactly is the value that I'm gonna get from my assets? How do I make sure that they're all driving value in the critical assets for my business? If that water bottle rep represented a bit of supply chain, notionally having all your assets together is also a supply chain. It'll have supplier, it'll have customers to that, that uh, value piece of, of supply chain, if you like, and there'll be another number of components and assets in the middle of that. Those components and assets can't do their job if maintenance is not supporting it. Maintenance can't do its job without parts supporting it. 
parts can't do its job if, a, if procurement isn't doing isn't working well and if someone's not paying the bills guess what your suppliers generally speaking aren't going to want to show up and help you either and so at some level you got to make sure your bills are paid and so that's the fundamental piece it's not just about maintenance it's it's really about maintenance and, and operations working together and committing to something called operational excellence being supported by parts and procurement and accounts payable one of the dilemmas is that many operational data systems, if you like, or op operational systems really only have data for their operation. And most maintenance systems really only look after the data for their maintenance systems. And most companies have gaps, even if they have a full ERP, such as SAP, collecting all this in one platform, there's still many times gaps where they are not capitalizing on the notion of how, how to measure success in what they're trying to do there. And so most operations and asset management systems do not blend data well for effective KPIs or a responsive asset management. So looking at that specifically, you say, well, if I, if I don't have that, how do I bridge that? And also when I go to do KPIs, recognize that the KPIs for the executive, the, the, the senior, most senior people in your organization are going to be different than perhaps for your middle management, perhaps for your actual maintenance tech, versus the asset itself. So there'll be different KPIs. And notionally what I've seen talking, walking into a number of organizations is they're very passionate about their KPIs. They may even be the right KPIs, but not recognizing that what's right for them is not necessarily the same metric that needs to apply for somebody at a different level in the organization. Another fundamental truth is that when you look at most complex assets, only about 11% of those assets fail over time and 89% actually fail randomly over time. And so understanding those components, which is primarily doing RCM and RCM analysis, helps you understand what should I apply? What's the right mitigating tactic to apply to that? And how do I deal with those 89% of things that are random over time? Well, I need to get a sense for what the warning time is, which is really the time between the potential failed state and the fully failed state, which is known as the P to F curve or the P to F time. And how do I get a handle for that? And if it's if it's a value time, so for instance, if if it's uh, three months between potential failed failed state to fully failed state, then I have time in that three months to be, maybe do an inspection or check to see if it is something is starting to show early indications of failure. Uh, if it's something such as an incandescent light bulb that fails somewhere between but and ink, you know, you turn the light on, it goes bink, then chances are that's not enough time for you to get between but and ink to go solve some of your issues. And if that's the case, then you need to decide what's the right mitigating tactic to solve that. If we are to put sensors in there as part of that solution, then the sensor itself leveraging IOT can help with that solution and do it and, and monitor that in some automated way. Every one of our assets, as I said, is critical to the value of that supply chain. And so as you look at each asset and say, how might that asset contribute to the value of supply chain? You can also look at that asset as a potential constraint to your supply chain and arguably measure what are the constraints of my supply chain to how we measure value in the overall business. And so that's something to consider when you're looking at those things. So many of you have heard of this notion of industry 4.0. As we look at 4.0, we're gonna recognize that the things that are somewhat new are internet of things. We have more and more networks, more and more technical capability. We have more and more cyber physical systems, if you like helping us with these things. So more and more of that is happening. And as we, we, we look through that opportunity, we see that actually technology is growing in many levels. There's digital technology, consumer technology, operational advances, uh, industrial technology, more and more things that are happening and IOT definitely will play, the internet of things definitely will play an important role in that future. So the, with looking at the four types of technology, as I said, I listed them earlier, these things can be disruptive. They're definitely gonna be disruptive if you elect not to actually address them as they've come up. Otherwise, you're gonna be, you're gonna become the constraint by ignoring this new technology. Industry 4.0 is driving enterprise asset management 4.0. And I would argue that that's actually driving into the notion of asset performance management, which is what we're gonna go and talk about later in this, this hour. 
Uh, it's going to, it can be disruptive if you don't deal with it. There's going to be emerging consequences of manifestations on how disruptive forces are affecting your customer, the enterprise, their expectations, uh, and, and the pressing challenges to stay competitive. These influences must, must be acknowledged in the near term. In other words, if you ignore them, then you ignore them basically at your peril. So what's in those things? Well, industrial technology, if you like, could be solar uh, specific to utility, could be solar storage, micro operations, wind fuel, fuel cells, in operations technology, there'll be smart grids and automated responses and uh, advanced network management, situa situational awareness. I'll talk about some of these things later. From a consumer perspective, we're all acquiring new products, if you like, that have a lot of this new technology stuff in it. More and more people have uh, smartphones. We have Google apps. We have uh, Alexis apps in our homes. There's lots and lots of these things that are there, social networks. And then the digital technology, which is more about what I'm going to talk about today, such as Internet of Things and data and analytics and artificial intelligence cloud, mobile, all those things are the kinds of things that we may need to think about. Along with notionally, there's other tools and toys out there, including drones that might go in and collect some data and, and help us understand some of the things that we might get a better handle on without having to have a physical person, say, climb up onto an electrical tower or, or you know inspect a road or those kinds of things. Some of the six basic digital technology trends presently shaping the industry are also this notion of IT and operations technology converging. We've already talked about Internet of Things. Situational awareness is just notionally the, 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 the fact that we're all talking with phones. We can quickly talk to each other. Hey, this is going on. What about that? Uh, we caught that we had uh, the incorrect uh, a link to this to this webinar and and we were able to communicate that communicate that using our phone about 30 minutes before this meeting big data and analytics cloud uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, another term uh, combined would be cognitive all those things are things that are e emerging as we try to understand where are we going with this business what are the tools that could help us as, as we move along Along with, so capitalizing that a little bit is this notion of well, artificial intelligence. It's coming, no, well, it's already here. We're already seeing it in social media. We're already seeing it in digital assistants. We're already seeing it in web searches. We're already seeing it in, in self-driving and, and parking vehicles coming along, uh, offline experiences such as Google Maps, email communications, all of this is happening. We already talked about Alexa and, and, and Google apps in your home. And I've got some pictures here of some robotic notions that if you ever go to a conference now, chances are you've got Boston Dynamics there with, the, with what I call the dancing dog, helping you with at least understanding the dynamic of it. I don't know if you've seen the video of that dancing like uh, Mick Jagger, that's quite, quite entertaining. Other things to think about, lessons learned in digital twinning. Leveraging that as perhaps an agile project with remote teams, we can, we can do that, a lot of that's happening. Maybe using it to start a proof of concept, to identify gaps or, and, and, and figure out how to close some gaps, do some sort of roadmap. And, and, and generally to make that work, you have to have a roadmap to, to understand how you're going to create that proof of concept and close those gaps. Look at digital versus organizational maturity. Quite often, <laughs> they're both not mature. Quite often you have to actually get both of these things kind of lined up and hey, we need to improve both of those things to, to get what we need to achieve operational readiness and operational excellence. Digital twinning is significant effort to, it, it, to get and establish and create the foundational elements, particularly the data in, in anything, whether it's AI, machine learning or digital twinning, it's all about data and getting that data something that you can make a decision on, which means that you're going to have to do an awful lot of curating, curate, curate, curate the data and curate, curate, curate the process. Have the end user involved. Uh, that's very, very key to the success. Mobile solutions can be part of that. Wearables can be part of that. Digital transformation is definitely essential if you want that to work. So plan to curate the data process in operating context. That's really what you need to be fussed with there. So we talked notionally about, well, where are people? An awful lot of people would say, well, hey, I have my EAM. I already have automated planning and scheduling. That was a big focus point about seven years ago. Key asset prioritization, integrated maintenance parts, 
We have maintenance KPIs. We have some reliability activity, but we started, we stopped, or we haven't started, or we think we have a culture and, and likely not the culture that we need for the future. We have new asset data to fuss with. We have some limited capabilities in data mining. We have some field support. We have some operations alignment. Now, that's actually not, definitely not a full list. And many organizations I'd walk in now and say, yeah, we're kind of playing in many of those things, but we're not necessarily where we want to be in all of those things. And so when you look at that, you say, well, okay, but where do you need to be? Where's the future? Well, we need to be more automated. It shouldn't just be EAM, but it also should be asset performance management. It also should be asset investment planning, which I'm not going to talk about today. It should also be optimizing operations, scheduling with maintenance, resource scheduling, and lining those things up and lining it up with other data, such as what's going on in the industry, what's going on in our client set, what's going on with weather, if weather is, influences your business. Having full reliability rules leveraged in your asset activity and prioritized, optimize operations and maintenance KPIs so they work together and have the data together so you can, they can work together. Having IoT and AI slash machine learning data analytics with uh, working for you. Having IT leveraged field service support, dynamic asset constraints, understanding what your constraints are so you can call out and, and warn the organization what some of those things are. And of course, there's a lot more. And all of these things create gaps. In this chart, I'm calling it the chasm of, of between EAM to IoT. So there's a lot there to think about. So how do you get better control of your asset management future? Well, you need to think about, well, why do we exist? We have the assets to drive value. As we look at this, asset management creates value and operations excellence, and hopefully that creates value to customer experience. But what are the pain points? Well, some of the pain points are going to be, well, have we missed our value commitments to our customers, uh, shareholders, or stakeholders due to asset constraints, maintenance uh, support, or lack of parts? Are those some of the things we, we, uh, we're, we're suffering with, suffering from? Virtually every organization is suffering from that at some level. And so from an asset management perspective, again, not an, an exhaustive list. You have the ability, and many organizations are stepping up to tracking assets and maintenance execution and first-time fix kind of things and managing their costs and parts support. And also the things that are affecting their, their operations. So you can measure things like overall equipment effectiveness, and, and having a sense of what your priority assets are and the reliability of, of, of those critical assets, having a notion of asset management automation, how do we automate those things so we can get maintenance and operations working together? And how do we make sure we get customer loyalty or at least happy customers if that's what we're measuring? Higher productivity, better return on asset, no health, safety, environmental and sustainability issues so our reputation is good and, and, and well received in, in, in our market. IT and asset management support strategies aligned to strategic value. Those are the kinds of things we need to fuss with. All while this technology is around, and if we ignore it, we ignore it at our peril, but it's there really to help us, and it's time to start stepping up. To do that, we need asset management culture. We need a reliability discipline, which many people have been ignoring. They say we have reliability culture, but we really haven't had the reliability discipline and the IT support of asset management. So we need IT there with us. All of this, by the way, it should go without saying, uh, change enablement, change management has to happen in your organization as well. Now, Gartner put out this report about 2015, and it basically just declared that there were three kind of self-sustaining systems, if you like, that are available or, or, or enterprise asset management or asset management type solutions available. One, most of you are aware of enterprise asset management. We're gonna talk about asset performance management later on in this presentation uh, to some degree, and then asset investment planning and how they all contribute to each other. So I just wanted to frame, if you like the discussion, just by suggesting that's there. And also go back to this chart where I said, we have the traditional value of asset management. And notionally now, if enterprise asset asset management manages things like asset hierarchies and maintenance execution and parts management and some of the KPIs that happen within that execution of that maintenance, including the ability to, to have some business intelligence and drive out some analysis. No, at no time does enterprise asset management actually really tell you what maintenance you could do. It mostly just helps you be more efficient in the execution of your maintenance. Understanding what maintenance you should do is more of a reliability center maintenance kind of argument. And that reliability center maintenance data typically 
or at least traditionally, didn't usually sit in an EIM. It sat outside the EIM. Now, more and more EIMs are starting to have a place for you to put that data, but that's really what opened up the asset performance market, asset performance management market, is to have a place for that enterprise asset management data so that you can manage that and have an understanding of, of the decisions that were made from that analysis repository. Now, asset performance management drives operational excellence. If you really wanted to know why do we do asset performance management, it's because we want to get in the game. It's a journey. It's not a destination. It requires community, collaborative coordination and effort. It requires operational agility and resilience. It requires a strategic focus on efficiency and effectiveness and strategic value in the market you serve. And it should align and work to optimize your people, process, technology, assets, and data. And this, these are all comments that came from ARC. Again, with ARC, why APM for operational excellence? Well, it's really about leveraging your existing vital data points. It's about providing quick access to critical information and contributing to operational performance automation. If anybody thinks the reason we have assets is just so we can fix them, well, no, we actually have assets for value. We need to drive value. That's why our organization exists. And we need to make sure that we do the things to drive that value. Now, there's a lot of data points under these charts, which I'm simply not going to take the time to talk to just now. As I said, I suggest if you want to get a copy of this presentation, we'd be happy to send it out to you and, and we can talk about it to you at another time to, just to fit into the, the hour that we have just now. The role of asset performance management solutions is really about leveraging existing asset data that you might already have from your asset management systems to also collect and centralize the asset risk and reliability strategy decision data to collect and centralize asset health data if your EAM doesn't collect that, to track asset health and predict and prioritize asset failures, to, dis to prescribe rather asset mitigation action execution. So let's say, hey, we're, we're hitting this threshold. Maybe we need to have an inspection here. Maybe something has to happen. To optimize maintenance planning and to enhance asset performance strategies. Now, how do you do that? Well, basically, you need a repository that doesn't exist right now in your EAM. You need something that says, hey, where do we hold our risk and decision data? Where do we hold our strategy decision engine to maybe make some decisions off of that, both our EAM data and our risk decision data? How do we understand how our asset performance is working and, and how do we create an engine to do that dynamically? And how do we create performance recommendations, performance notices out of that? All of these things are things that will help you fulfill, if you like, your need that's kind of missing in an automated way, typically in the average enterprise asset management system. The kind of data inputs you have would obviously be the data from your EAM. It would also be data from IoT data, including data from sensors. It could be operational data, and it could be external data. And external data could be things like seasonality, could be market data, could be weather, could be any of those kinds of things that you might want to put into that equation. All right, so another way to look at this, and, and I'm picking on a particular solution, but mock it up so it's not really uh, anybody's solution in, in particular. And as we look at this, we say, okay, we want to take our EAM data and not an exhaustive list, but to give you a sense of some of the things that are going to be in your EAM, such as asset data and work history and, and inspection data, hopefully, and calibration history, and maybe even asset health, if, you, if you're collecting it there. And say, okay, if we've done our RCM analysis, where do we hold that data? Well, we're going to hold that in the asset risk data repository. So we can have our, our asset risk criticality settings all lined up against the asset uh, hierarchies. Safety environmental things, HAZOPS, fault tree analysis, the RCM data, as I said, risk-based inspections, failure modes effects analysis, all the mitigating tactics, all of that can be held there. Then you have your asset policy. So given the dynamics, at what threshold do we decide to do something, whether it be a safety threshold, an asset health threshold, a repair versus replace policy, all those kinds of things. How do we actually manage this data dynamically? Well, we need some sort of performance engine and tracker to kind of say, here's what we're doing. Here's what looks like it could be a problem going forward. Here's where we need to do some dynamic, dynamic response now. Maybe we do some digital twinning analysis here and collect that dynamically along with the IoT sensor data that we're collecting, the external operational data. And with all of that, 
drop out or file uh, throw it if you like, or send out some warnings, some analysis, automated work orders, all those kinds of outputs that would come from this process. Frankly, the biggest piece that's missing are some of the key data points, understanding how critical your data, your asset is, understanding in what ways uh, your asset could fail and how you could mitigate the risk of an asset failure. So that's the RCM data that really didn't get captured in any repository to be used in an automated way. And what would the consequence of an asset failure be and how would that failure affect our business objectives? So as we look at the business generally and how things are aligned and how things are, are set up from an evolution of where the different business organizations are, you may have been manual. If you go back 10, 20, maybe even 25 years, perhaps you were a manual operation. Then you had a campus-wide system called a computerized maintenance management system. Uh, hopefully you've evolved to an enterprise asset management system that would look at multiple campuses of data and, and hold on to that. The next evolution is to take advantage of this asset performance data and ultimately understand why you're strategically aligned and how do I take advantage of those things, whether it be machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and operating operations technology, those kinds of things. How do we get those things together so that we can align this and have more of an asset management or maintenance organization contribution to why you strategically exist as an organization. Now, it's interesting, I'll go back to this chart. AIC put this out in 2019. I actually published a version of this when I was at IBM almost a decade ago. So I'm not sure if they've taken this from you know, something that was out there or they came to this conclusion on their own, but it's interesting that they published this just a few years back. Now, I took that version of what I created almost a decade ago and simplified it to say you could have gone from manual to EAM to APM to machine learning and AI, really to go from manual to efficient to effective to why we strategically exist in terms of value in our supply chain. And to support that, I need asset management strategy, I need IT support at the table, or it's simply not going to be engaged to work. And we need change enablement if we expect this to work. Now, to go to something that looks a little bit more like that original chart. It's really about at what level is IT support commitment there to support us in asset management and to what, what level are we as an organization ready and mature enough to actually ask for the things that we need from an asset management maturity perspective. From the pure efficiently, efficiency level, then primarily you're putting in an EIM system. And if all you've done is put in an EAM system, then congratulations, you're about four bullets from the bottom. So you might have gone from manual and done some preventive, and asset, uh, preventive maintenance and asset prioritization and maybe some manual asset investment planning with a spreadsheet, but you put in this EAM system, EAM system, maybe you've actually automated some of your planning and scheduling. So again, you're not four bullets from the bottom, you're five bullets from the bottom, but there's a lot more to be done. You need to do some sort of risk and in reliability analysis or RCM analysis, you need to be thinking about from that analysis, where should I put condition-based monitoring tactics and automate that with IoT type uh, technology and have some sort of automated asset performance management and automated asset investment planning. If I do those things now, I'm going from efficient to also making sure I do the effective things efficiently and starting to automate some of those things. To take it to the next level, I can take some of that data now and say, well, let's predict go from predictive to operations prescriptive. Let's do AI and machine learning things, which is another term for cognitive. And let's do some predictive asset optimization. And let's really align why we do our maintenance and how we do our maintenance right through the whole operational excellence continuum into having supply chain optimization and how asset management contributes to that. Now, it was and probably still is for most, most organizations, something where people would say, hey, I'm still dealing with efficiency, so I'm focusing on plan versus unplanned. If you could take that focus on plan, which you still need to fix, and get to focused on going to also focus on what can I predict, then think of the, the benefits your organization could have. They are going to be considerable. Work in asset management solutions, asset optimization, prescriptive asset management, prescriptive operations management, integrated optimal supply chain. Those are the kinds of things that you can fix and contribute to as you bring these kinds of solutions on board. So we talked about the traditional value of asset management and, and asset performance management, EAM. And I'm gonna say, well, that's really, and I already said this, that's the RCM data inside the asset performance management 
And when we do that, particularly if you do an RCM3 analysis, you can start looking at, well, what's the criticality and how can I mitigate that even while we're doing our analysis? One of the concerns I'm finding, especially in the last few years when I've been helping organizations with their priorities is they'll say, well, hey, we already have an RCM culture and maybe what we're doing is enough. And I just wanna talk a little bit about that, but first, what is RCM? RCM is a process used to determine what must be done to ensure that assets continue to fulfill their functions in their current operating context. So I need to make sure that we have maintenance and engineering and, and the operations folks all together and agreeing on what that means and going through this process of asset and operating context, uh, determining the desired function, the failed state, the cause, the consequence and the prescribed task. All of that drop, drops out data as we go through that process. And the primary data points are going to be asset data, operating context, function, failed state or, or, or functional failure, if you like, failure mode and effects. So failure modes effects analysis is in there. What are the inherent risk? What's the consequence of failure? How do we mitigate um, that consequence? So what's the mitigation tactic and frequency? And, and, and what's the resulting work or inspection that comes from that? So in that, we're gonna talk about criticality. We're gonna talk about whether something fails or not. So is it part of that 89%, not part of that 89%? And what's the best tactic if it is part of that 89%? How do I inspect for decline for a decline state or or a, uh, we'll just call that decline state? And how do I confirm that? And can we automate that? So many organizations I walk into, they say, hey, we already have a foundational reliability culture. We're out doing things like asset baseline health metrics and bad actor asset, uh, having our bad actor assets identified and eliminating defects and having teams to do that. We're doing outage reviews. We're doing backlog reviews, we have total productive maintenance groups, and we have that culture well entrenched, and we have good scheduled compliance. Now, if I stopped there and said, you have that, wonderful, that is wonderful. I would argue that most organizations I walk into would say, yeah, we wish we were doing all those things. We kind of talk about all those things, but we're not really doing all those things. And what I want to suggest to you, even if you are doing all those things, you're definitely not doing enough. You really do need to put together a reliability center culture, it's a reliability center maintenance culture, and get into the discipline, particularly if you want to be prepared for the technology that's available to us now. You need to identify and prioritize critical assets and create trained reliability teams. You need to create maintenance operations and design engineering folks and get them together and include them all. You need to calibrate the methods through some sort of introductions training. You need to create RCM facilitators and pilot some reliability analysis. You need to document each asset's operating context. You need to create the insights to, to prescribe the best mitigation tactics, create the thresholds for flagging actions, particularly true and, and uh, when you're uh, forced out when you're doing an RCM3 analysis. You need to document the data and tactic plans in your EIM solution, or at least, so the actual plans go in your EIM, but when you're, the thresholds might be in your APM and get management committed to it, get them actually signed off on it. If you do that, think of the data that you're going to collect that now you can put into an IT and IoT enabled reliability culture. With that, you're gonna have health data, you're gonna have transaction reliability threshold data, you're gonna understand where market data and external data applies. You could, and this is a very controversial topic, even get to a point where IT and artificial intelligence so IT data and artificial intelligence help you automate a first pass of RCM analysis. Now, that's a controversial topic. I, I, I must confess, I don't see, or I'm not aware of anybody doing that yet, where it's actually proven and, and they've used it as a, as a paper and published it, but it's something that certainly can be done. If we can use both structured and unstructured data to, with artificial intelligence to analyze different approaches to uh, mitigate cancer, we certainly can use the same arguments to mitigate failures of equipment. And so it's just something that's there. It's something that can be done. It's going to be in the future for sure. And as I said, it's a bit controversial because I'm putting it out there, but no one's done it yet that I'm aware of. Now, also, you can have an IT integrated reliability culture. Now, think about if you have data scientists, think of how your data scientists could take advantage of all that data. They could really look at asset operating context and failure modes effects analysis data and mitigating tactics and thresholds and automate and, and help you automate decisions on from the reliability data insights, as opposed to trying to generate them, particularly 
is, is a difficult use of their time if they are not trained and aware of what happens in a reliability maintenance culture. What would the savings be? Well, I'm gonna be conservative and say the benefits and savings are going to be at least what is declared when you look at a reliability center maintenance culture. And that is notionally improved productivity, in, increased maintenance effectiveness and reduced costs pretty much across the board, okay? Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about data and, and leveraging advanced data analytics and just notionally, and McKinsey put this out probably about a decade ago. I love this chart. If, if I look at traditional data, if you have data, then what information can I get from that data? What insights can I get from that information? What decisions can I make? And then all, it works the other way around too. Decisions, what decisions do I need to make? What insights do I need to make those decisions? What information do I need to get those insights? And what data do I need to get that information? Typically a data scientist, if the data is there, will start at the top left where a reliability center maintenance person will say, well, wait a sec, I need to say, I have the asset with the operating context, those kinds of things. And it stops at the bottom right. Notionally, we need both organizations and both teams working on this data, but just understand typically where they might start. And data dependencies are very important in the business. We need to make sure that we're really driving the data. And as we look at all the different kinds of data that you might want to have in place, the simple statement is, make sure that you have someone that looks at your data and understands how we can deal with and mitigate the data challenges, getting the data elements right, getting back notionally to curating the data as well. So getting the data elements right, understanding the interrelated data dependencies, confirming the source and the quality of the data, getting comfortable that the decisions can be made from data insights. So that's notionally curating it to make sure we get it right building the process execution into the system to automate process triggers, alerts, and steps, and driving value from those data dynamics. So we need to understand that, make sure we're getting data. Understand your operation with analytics. I would say understand your operation with RCM, but analytics is also going to support that. We need data quite often in RCM as well. Once you have the data, you have to convert that into information. That's really the, the, the point I was trying to make a chart or two back. Organizations need to be put in place, uh, analytical capabilities, which people uh, are put in place. Uh, uh, that sentence doesn't flow for me. Anyway, we need to analytical capabilities, which people can use to understand the data. If you have usage data coming off of sensors, such as on an elevator or elevator shaft, it can help monitor the usage, flag issues, and find patterns so you can predict when failure might occur. And so that's also part of the issue. When we look at the asset performance management landscape, what I said to you before is asset performance management right now is kind of the wild, wild west. There are EAM solution providers now moving into this space. There are traditional APM solution vendors that I've had experience with what is now Bentley when I was working with them was Ivera and GE, which when I was working with was Meridium. But th those are pri the primary ones that have been out there for the longest time. But we're starting to see some of the EAMs moving in. We're, we're seeing some sensor and instrumentation vendors say, hey, we're in this space. We, we have sensors and things. We have enabled digital service providers in this space. We have APM and PDM maintenance specialists. So all these people play. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the EAMs, EAM ones briefly. Uh, we'll start with SAP. Notionally, they'd say this is a space they plan to be in in the future. They're not really in this space right now, but they certainly have the mindset and they certainly have the graphics to suggest that they're, they're moving in that direction. When they look at asset performance management, um, they have asset strategy and performance and they have asset health predict, prediction and optimization and environmental health and safety things that they're dealing with to complement the actual orchestration and scheduling and execution of the maintenance. So they're, they're seeing it there and they're evolving into that space. They suggest that you need to adopt a collaborative process across the enterprise and, and, and partner network. In, 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 this, in this case, the SAP's partner network is their, their installers, the people that, their integrators, the people actually integrate SAP for them. They need to connect assets with industry 4.0 functionality for real-time predictive and prescriptive maintenance. And they need to integrate maintenance and operations with IT functionality to remove the silos in the supply chain. So these are words that I grappled out of the presentation that was given by the head of SAP at the conference in Australia just a few months ago. I think I added tenaciously increase asset performance, reduce maintenance costs and support operational excellence. And when I look at Maximo, I, the same words really apply. 
Now I borrowed the words from the previous group, but this is the Maximal presentation chart and how they have, have uh, marketed their processes, if you like, and suggesting things like visual and health and predict all are things that they're starting to add. Safety has been there for a while. They're adding things like assist. And so more and more of their solutions are there. And more and more, I would suggest, even when we look at their roadmap, Maximo is saying, hey, reliability data is coming. So they definitely look like they're moving in that direction. Again, when I look at the, the Maximo announcement that came out last summer, they're suggesting that they now have templates to assist in data development. They have over, a, they have hundreds, not just over a hundred, hundreds of algorithms to help, to help in, optimize matches on some of the existing data that might be there. They have the ability to integrate to external data points. Uh, they have the ability to optimize modeling and criticality and risk scores and, and asset health registers and replacement and refurbishment planning. So they have a lot of those things in there that we would not have seen a couple of years back. And that a lot of that was announced just in the past July. And they've also spent a fair bit of time talking about visual inspection analytics capabilities that are now in their EAM solution, but I've also added slash APM solution. So I'm now branding it that way from my perspective. So now they're also suggesting leading companies can transform their field operations by leveraging remote support capabilities from mobile devices. Technicians can access the power of AI remotely. Uh, Real-time availability of an expert, again, that they can be supported uh, remotely. Uh, constant connection, again, a lot, a lot of that is it's something that can be connected remotely and saving collaboration results and understanding, you know, what, how did other people fix a solution very similar and, and how might that play? That's an interesting one to me because when I was a maintenance tech for IBM, because I was a mainframe repair guy earlier in my career, uh, gosh, more than 30 years ago, the reality is that was around then. It just wasn't something that was commercially available. It was something we built in house. We were definitely not the shoemaker's kids when I was a maintenance tech at IBM. Something you should never forget though, this is a big jump for everybody and you must determine, determine your asset management priorities in, in what you're going to adopt. And this requires a huge change management mindset. You need to get your priorities right. You need to get your leaders aligned. You need to include your staff, your, your staff to understand what the priorities are and why those are the priorities. Understand where you are and what the journey is going to be both in the near term and long term. You need to get IT and, I, and, I, and OT, rather, not IoT, IT and OT, and the maintenance team aligned to support each other. So it really takes a community, and you need to get started. I mean, that's the simple answer to this. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's, <laughs> I, I can't say it any cleaner than that. You need to make sure that you have culture as part of it, understand where your gaps are, make sure you're dragging your culture along as you're trying to make these things happen. So what should your next steps be? As we look at your next steps, uh, well, you need to check your culture. Where are we? Uh, you know, what have we not been doing? Have we been allowing the fox to run the hen house a little bit in terms of what it is we're trying to get done and how do we align ourselves to why are we here and what it is we really need to get accomplished? We need to get our leadership aligned. We need to get people aligned and training can help with that. Maybe perhaps we need some training to do that. Do we have an asset management assessment or do we need to do one? If you've done one before, maybe you need to do one again, just to get everybody aligned as to where we are versus where we were a few years back. Get IT and asset management leadership together. Acquire and implement the IT tools, whether you need to improve your EAM, your APM, your IoT stuff. Embrace this notion of Industry 4.0. It's not going to go away. And you need to recognize that we're all here to pursue operational excellence. And so at some level, chances are everyone on this call will recognize they have to do some or all of what's above in this chart. And so you need to get started. I mean, that's really notionally what you need to do. Uh, understand what you need to do and go get started. So I have covered an awful lot of the things I, I suggested I was going to cover. Uh, the value of asset management, the technology trends in Industry 4.0 the functional gaps in, in many asset intensive organizational programs. If you have any questions, if you wanna key something in, please do so. I've got a couple more charts to go through, but this would be a good time to, to key your questions in. We talked about asset performance management. We talked about the IT continuum and asset management. We talked about this notion of reliability culture and where are you and where do you need to be? Particularly if you wanna prepare, prepare for the future, you need to recognize that 
you're not going to be as successful as you could be if you ignore this notion of doing the reliability discipline things. The role of data in deriving value decisions from insights and information. Understanding there are vendors out there that have evolved themselves and how quickly is the vendor that you have right now moving to where you need to be. Recognize your pro progress gaps in asset management. That's been the primary motivation for everything that I end up talking about in these, in these uh, webinars and what I teach when I'm teaching is where are the gaps and what should people be thinking about? One of the questions you could be asking yourself simply is where do I stand on this list? Uh, and I'm not going to read through this list. I'll just put, put out a few points. And as I said, if you want to copy this, I'll take a picture of it, I guess. Get your camera and take a picture of it or ask, ask for a copy of this presentation and we'll send it to you. But uh, where, where are you? Does your enterprise understand and fully follow an internally accepted standard? Which is a good example. Or, or do, are you doing EAM? Are you doing APM? Are you doing asset investment planning? Do you have asset management operations and supply chain Align is IT there to help? All those things that you want to maybe ask yourself. And the bottom line, do we fully understand, execute optimal algorithms to deliver our, our production value to our target market? I mean, there's more questions you could ask yourself, but there's an example of a question that you could be there. So I have a question. Let's see, Gordon, on the next steps chart, how do we help us to get going? Uh, is there one or a few, is, is there a one or a few day engagement that you can offer? Okay. So, yeah. So thank you for that question. I guess, uh, Gordon, I think you threw that out there. Let me just hold that question and I will come back to it if that's okay. All right. So here's where I was going to ask questions. And so let me maybe just talk a little bit about that. Thanks for that. Some of the things you might want to fuss with is, you know, for instance, Culture, culture, culture. We see culture eats strategy, right? Understand where your culture is, your process, your technology, how it plays in an asset intensive organization. Now, this may seem like a, a, an obvious answer, or maybe not an obvious answer, but you really need to understand where you are holistically and where you are with the fundamentals because everyone's going to fight their priority versus somebody else's priority if we don't get everybody together. So I would suggest you want to leverage the asset management excellence pyramid and prioritize opportunities with a cross-functional group and sort that through. Now, unfortunately, uh, the, the pyramid will pop up after I say that. And also, I think you need to readdress your reliability center maintenance culture. Uh, so let me just go back to that. So the, the maintenance excellence pyramid is, is just popping up there now. Sorry, it's just the way this I, I set this up. I, I didn't quite get the timing of that right. There is a process you would go through. At least one organization that's on the call today has been through that with me in the Caribbean. And also think about where you are in this, this, uh, this continuum. But really just think about this asset management excellence uh, assessment kind of thing and where you could be. I think that's worthwhile. Understand where your measurements are. What are your pain points? What's your business pain points? So those are some of the things that you might want to look at. If you want to facilitate an asset management maturity, which is, is just more of a more foundational thing, it's really the same steps looking at the asset management pyram pyramid and, and uh, going through that same process. If you want to create an asset management plan, policy, and strategy, uh, you may want to do that. Now, I thought I saw another question come up. So let me just go to the chat. Do we need an internal champion? Who should that be? Well, what you really need is, is your executive, your COO, your, your, your head of maintenance, so th those kinds of people, it could be, it really needs to be an executive who drives us, understands the business problem, because all of these things are, are going to drive culture, they're going to drive uh, profitability to the business. And, and so ideally, you want one of your executives to lead that, or you need somebody who can be a strong leader that can, has the ear of that executive. So your executive might be the sponsor, and that person could be the person who will lead it on behalf of the sponsor and has the ear of, of the executive. Ideally, you want your maintenance and your operations people, your CFO, all these people working together along with your CIO to recognize that this is a priority that we need to get to. There is a significant bottom line and that sig significant bottom line can be sized fairly, fairly quickly. You can do a, an SAMP, which is pretty typical. I'm not sure why I say municipal model, but it could be any organization. Uh, you could do an SAMP, uh, which is a traditional thing under the ISO 55,000. You could do something like that. Certainly you want to get your folks trained. There's a number of different training programs available that I can help you with. 
And at some level, you're going to probably want to do some or all of these things that you want to try and accomplish. I thought I'd share with you too, just one more chart here about uh, some of the training. I have a maintenance parts program coming available on March the 7th. I have an IT and IoT full day training session on April the 28th. And the program that I teach at the University of Toronto, I've had a couple of clients, that's normally a five-day program, which we only teach in November. I have a, I had a couple of clients come forward and say, Don, we really just want the, the, what the leaders need to know. We don't need the deep mathematics. We just want the high-level stuff. And I already have a program, a generic program for that, which I've called the, the Physical Asset Management Introduction for Asset Management Leaders. And that's coming out in May. So anybody has any interest in that, I just want to make you aware of that. So that's some training. So with that, I think I'll just say thank you to everybody. I'm going to open this up to questions. I'll close the, the presentation shortly. And again, suggest if you want a copy of this, send either Gordon or myself an email, and we'd be happy to do that. So I'm going to stop the share, and I'm going to open this up and ask if anybody has any questions, please uh, let us know. Right. Questions, anyone? Well, listen, uh, with no questions done, any, any final words? No, it just, this is, to me, this is a very exciting place to be. If you're an asset management person, first of all, thank you for taking the time to calling in and listening to this. Uh, this is a very exciting place to be. I, I've had more people kind of go, didn't know what my career would be in asset management. I've had 45 years here. I'm still loving it. It's a great place to be. Uh, has a huge benefit, if you like, or a huge contribution to your business and certainly a significant career that you can get out of it. And you can help drive your organization to those benefits. All you have to do is share some of this material with your leadership. Or if you're the leader, go drive it with your peers and let's go, let's go change your business. Let's, let's get you to be a leader. I think that's how I would leave it and ask if anybody, again, has any comments or questions. I'll just look to see. There's a couple of comments that came up. Um, so people have thanked us for the presentation. And uh, yeah, and don't be shy. Give us a call if you have any questions. We will send out this presentation. All you can do is ask us, all right? And you're very welcome for the, for the presentation. So before you go, we will be com um, communicating with, with you after the session. Um, Karishma, who is online with us, thanks for doing the organizing along with Don to make the session a reality. Um, but yes, we will be sending out information to you over the next, I think, 48 hours or so. Um, I think we'll have a questionnaire that we'll ask you to give some feedback on the session. We want to continue to make this relevant. And in there or in response to that email, as a reminder, certainly let us know. We'll get, we'll get ourselves connected with you for that next meeting. We understand that this topic could be heavy if you don't understand it, but we're trying to simplify it because we believe it is one of the things that we need to drive forward um, for our customers, our potential clients. And we are willing to go the journey. We have uh, two of these sessions so far. We have not pl yet planned a third. We have some training. We have some capabilities that we are quite willing to um, share with you. Uh, so that you can align your thought with how this area can bring value, real value to your organization. Don mentioned the CFO. Many times, well, my learning so far, you know, from Don, and we have done this a very long time, together with his career at IBM, my career at IBM, we've been working at this. You really have to personalize this and put it to your business to see how you get a longer life out of your personal assets, your car, your home. What are the things you do? And so your business will have a multiplier effect just from mere size. So your CFO is definitely interested. How can you save costs, maintenance costs, repair costs? Your operation folks are definitely interested. How can you continue to serve the client? Um, and always be up and available depending on where you are in the supply chain. But you will need people in your supply chain that, that will be able to consistently deliver your product with the right quality and in time without breakdown in their service. So, you know, listen, we have access to Don. We have access 
you know, to IGT, who has done a lot of this with, with major clients. And between us, the consulting, the training, the services, the support, we believe that we have you covered. So look for the next email coming out or beforehand, pop us an email uh, between Don and myself. We will circle back with you and see if we can help you derive a path forward. And to start, it's not that expensive and it's not that too much of an investment. It's not a cost. It's, it's an investment. Once you, see, once you see the value proposition and you can tie, this, tie the returns to your organization at all levels, this is something you will want to do. You just have to get to the right switch on the wall to turn it on to see where you can be. So thanks again, everyone, for joining. And we look forward to your uh, feedback and requests of us to be of service to you. Enjoy your day and do keep healthy. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gord. Everybody take care. Hope you have a great day. You've been watching the Preparing for Reliability with Emerging Asset Performance Technology Trends presented by Don Barry of Asset Acumen Consulting. This presentation was hosted by Gordon Foote from Info Global Tech. Thank you for watching.